Hello, and welcome to Book Nook. I'm Lynn Kessler with Read Aloud West Virginia. Thank you for joining us today to read some books. Also with us today, we have Suzanne Caulfield, the co-director of Charleston Montessori School. Hi, Suzanne. Hi. Thank How are you? Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for coming. We're so happy to have you. Welcome. So you are co-director of Charleston Montessori School. I am. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the Montessori approach to learning. I know it's a little different than our traditional approach. It is very different. Um, the Montessori method was developed by Maria Montessori over a hundred years ago. And because we're talking about reading, I'll focus on how the language is different. Maria Montessori developed a very unique manipulative approach to teaching children the sounds that the letters make. Um, she started with tablets that have the letters, the symbols for, for the sounds in sand. And so the children start learning with sandpaper letters and they use two fingers from their dominant hand to trace the letters the same way that they would be written using those strokes. Mm. And then they move on to tracing the letters in sand, um, so soft sand. Mm -hmm. And then next they work with a movable alphabet and Maria Montessori realized that children can begin encoding, building words mm -hmm. far earlier than they're ready to decode. And so that's some of her method, which is really brilliant. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. It's very tactile. It is. That's interesting. It is. So what role does Read Aloud play in your school? Uh, Read Aloud plays a, a great role. West Virginia Read Aloud um, volunteers have been in all of our classrooms and the children and I think the readers um, have just loved that experience. And then Read Aloud, uh, aside from our West Virginia Read Aloud readers, happens daily with children reading aloud to their teachers or to parent volunteers who come in and then children read to each other. The Montessori way of learning is multi-age classrooms and the older children are often teaching the younger ones. Sometimes it's even a younger child who's mastered something earlier teaching an older one. Um, but the multi-age classrooms really lend themselves to children working in small groups mm -hmm. and reading together. Wow, that's really interesting. So do you have any favorite books from your childhood that you would like to tell like us about? I feel like there are so many. <laughs> of course, I mean, I definitely grew up on a lot of Dr. Seuss. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, as reading evolved and I was reading on my own, I loved mysteries and went mm -hmm. through like every Encyclopedia Brown and then as I got older into Agatha Christie's and mm -hmm. it's um, interesting for me now my 10 year old daughter is also starting to be a mystery lover and I've told her that she's you know inherited it. It's nice to see those things passed on it to is. your kids. It is yeah. and then my mother is a voracious reader and always read with me and my sister mm -hmm. Um, and we would read all together, just pick a book we wanted to read and take turns reading chapters. Uh -huh. So I uh, you know, have vivid memories of books like Penrod and um, The Best L Little Christmas Pageant Ever. Mm -hmm. Just some of those fun books to those, read and laugh. And <laughs> yeah, those memories are so priceless and that's, they are. that's one of the things we really encourage at Read Aloud is forming those bonds over books because then children associate that positive feeling of love from their parent with reading. And I believe in that wholeheartedly. Yeah. So, yeah. And we don't, in the Montessori um, classrooms, we don't have them at like saying that you're at this level, you can only mm -hmm. read these books. We really let the children explore their interests and they're exposed to a wide range of books about the, the real natural world. Mm -hmm. And so it's not unusual for like three to six year olds to know all, like all the parts of a flower and say that's the stamen or uh -huh. you know be talking about something in Asian culture. Yes. Um, wow. But it's because they have access to all that reading material. And they are capable of so much more than we give them they credit sure for are. sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. Well, thank you for telling us some about the, the Montessori approach. That's oh, my pleasure. Really interesting to learn. 
Um, so what, what book are you going to start reading today? I'm going to start with The Relatives Came by Cynthia Ryland, and she is one of my favorite West Virginia authors. The Relatives Came by Cynthia Ryland, illustrated by Stephen Gamble. It was in the summer of the year when the relatives came. They came up from Virginia. They left when their grapes were nearly purple enough to pick, but not quite. They had an old station wagon that smelled like a real car, and in it they put an ice chest full of soda pop and some boxes of crackers and some bologna, bologna sandwiches, and up they came from Virginia. They left at four in the morning when it was still dark, before even the birds were awake. They drove all day long and into the night, and while they traveled along, they looked at the strange houses and different mountains, and they thought about their almost purple grapes back home. They thought about Virginia, but they thought about us too, waiting for them. So they drank up all their pop and ate up all their crackers, and traveled up all those miles until finally they pulled into our yard. Then it was hugging time. Talk about hugging. Those relatives just passed us all around their car, pulling us against their wrinkled Virginia clothes, crying sometimes. They hugged us for hours. Then it was into the house and so much laughing and shining faces and hugging in the doorways. You'd have to go through at least four different hugs to get from the kitchen to the front room, those relatives. And finally, after a big supper two or three times around until we all got a turn at the table, there was quiet talk and we were in twos and threes through the house. The relatives weren't particular about beds, which was good since there weren't any extras. So a few squeezed in with us and the rest slept on the floor, some with their arms thrown over the closest person or some with an arm across one person and a leg across another. It was different going to sleep with all that new breathing in the house. The relatives stayed for weeks and weeks. They helped us tend the garden, and they fixed any broken things they could find. They ate up all our strawberries and melons, then promised we could eat up all their grapes and peaches when we came to Virginia. But none of us thought about Virginia much. We were so busy hugging and eating and breathing together. Finally, after a long time, the relatives loaded up their ice chest and headed back to Virginia at four in the morning. We stood there in our pajamas and waved them off in the dark. We watched the relatives disappear down the road. Then we crawled back into our beds that felt too big and too quiet. We fell asleep. And the relatives drove on all day long and into the night. And while they traveled along, they looked at the strange houses and different mountains, and they thought about their dark purple grapes waiting at home in Virginia. But they thought about us, too, missing them, and they missed us. When they were finally home in Virginia, they crawled into their silent, soft beds and dreamed about the next summer. And the next book I'll read is Blueberries for Sal by Robert McCloskey. One day, little Sal went with her mother to Blueberry Hill to pick blueberries. Little Sal brought along her small tin pail, and her mother brought her large tin pail to put berries in. We will take our berries home and can them, said her mother. Then we will have food for the winter. 
Little Sal picked three berries and dropped them in her little tin pail. Kaplink, kaplank, kaplunk. She picked three more berries and ate them. Then she picked more berries and dropped one in the pail. Kaplunk. And the rest she ate. Then Little Sal ate all four blueberries out of her pail. Her mother walked slowly through the bushes, picking blueberries as she went and putting them in her pail. Little Sal struggle, struggled along behind, picking blueberries and eating every single one. Little Sal hurried ahead and dropped a blueberry in her mother's pail. It didn't sound kaplink because the bottom of the pail was already covered with berries. She reached down inside to get her berry back. Though she didn't really mean to, she pulled out a large handful because there were so many blueberries right up close to the one she had put in. Her mother stopped picking and said, Now, Sal, you run along and pick your berries. Mother wants to take her berries home and can them for next winter. Her mother went back to her picking, but little Sal, because her feet were tired of standing and walking, sat down in the middle of a large clump of bushes and ate blueberries. On the other side of Blueberry Hill, Little Bear came with his mother to eat blueberries. Little Bear, she said, eat lots of berries and grow big and fat. We must store up food for the long, cold winter. Little Bear followed behind his mother as she walked slowly through the bushes eating berries. Little Bear stopped now and then to eat berries. Then he had to hustle along to catch up. Because his feet were tired of hustling, he picked out a large clump of bushes and sat right down in the middle and ate blueberries. Over on the other side of the hill, Little Sal ate all of the berries she could reach from where she was sitting. Then she started out to find her mother. She heard a noise from around a rock and thought, that is my mother walking along. But it was a mother crow and her children and they stopped eating berries and flew away saying, caw, caw, caw. Then she heard another noise in the bushes and thought, that is surely my mother and I will go that way. But it was Little Bear's mother instead. She was tramping along, eating berries, and thinking about storing up food for the winter. Little Sal tramped right along behind. By this time, Little Bear had eaten all the berries he could reach without moving from his clump of bushes. Then he hustled off to catch up with his mother he hunted and hunted, but his mother was nowhere to be seen. He heard a noise from over a stump and thought, that is my mother walking along. But it was a mother partridge and her children. They stopped eating berries and hurried away. Then he heard a noise in the bushes and thought, that is surely my mother. I will hustle that way. But it was little Sal's mother instead. She was walking along picking berries and thinking about canning them for next winter. Little Bear hustled right along behind. Little Bear and Sal's mother and Little Sal and Little Bear's mother were all mixed up with each other among the blueberries on Blueberry Hill. Little Bear's mother heard Sal walking along behind and thought it was Little Bear and she said, Little Bear, munch, munch, eat all you gulp, can possibly hold, swallow. Little Sal said nothing. She picked three berries and dropped them, kaplink, kaplink, kaplunk, in her small tin pail. Little Bear's mother turned around to see what on earth could make a noise like kaplunk. Galumph, she cried, choking on a mouthful of berries. That is not my child. Where is Little Bear? She took one good look and backed away. She was old enough to be shy of people, even a very small person like little Sal. Then she turned around and walked off very fast to hunt for little bear. Little Sal's mother heard little bear tramping along behind and thought it was little Sal. 
she kept right on picking and thinking about canning blueberries for next winter. Little Bear padded up and peeked into her pail. Of course, he only wanted to taste a few of what was inside, but there were so many and they were so close together that he tasted a tremendous mouthful by mistake. Now, Sal, said Little Sal's mother without turning around, you run along and pick your own berries. Mother wants to can these for next winter. Little Bear tasted another tremendous mouthful and almost spilled the entire pail of blueberries. Little Sal's mother turned around and gasped, My goodness, you are not Little Sal. Where, oh, where is my child? Little Bear just sat munching and munching and swallowing and licking his lips. Little Sal's mother slowly backed away. She was old enough to be shy of bears, even very small bears like Little Bear. Then she turned and walked away quickly to look for little Sal. She hadn't gone very far before she heard a kaplink, kaplank, kaplunk. She knew just what made that kind of a sound. Little Bear's mother had not hunted very long before she heard a rustling sound that stopped now and then to munch and swallow. She knew just what made that kind of a noise. Little Bear and his mother went home down one side of Blueberry Hill, eating blueberries all the way and full of food stored up for next winter. And Little Sal and her mother went down the other side of Blueberry Hill, picking blueberries all the way and drove home with food to can for next winter, a whole pail of blueberries and three more besides. And the next book that I would like to read is by Eric Carle, The Very Quiet Cricket. One warm day from a tiny egg, a little cricket was born. Welcome, chirped a big cricket, rubbing his wings together. The little cricket wanted to answer, so he rubbed his wings together. But nothing happened, not a sound. Good morning, whizzed a locust, spinning through the air. The little cricket wanted to answer, so he rubbed his wings together. But nothing happened, not a sound. Hello, whispered a praying mantis, scraping its huge front legs together. The little cricket wanted to answer, so he rubbed his wings together, but nothing happened, not a sound. Good day, crunched a worm, munching its way out of an apple. The little cricket wanted to answer, so he rubbed his wings together, but nothing happened, not a sound. Hi, bubbled a spittlebug, slurping in a sea of froth. The little cricket wanted to answer, so he rubbed his wings together, but nothing happened, not a sound. Good afternoon, screeched a cicada, clinging to a branch of a tree. The little cricket wanted to answer, so he rubbed his wings together, but nothing happened, not a sound. How are you, hummed a bumblebee, flying from flower to flower. The little cricket wanted to answer, so he rubbed his wings together, but nothing happened, not a sound. Good evening, whirred a dragonfly, gliding above the water. The little cricket wanted to answer, so he rubbed his wings together, but nothing happened, not a sound. Good night, buzzed the mosquitoes, dancing among the stars. The little cricket wanted to answer, so he rubbed his wings together, but nothing happened, not a sound. A luna moth sailed quietly through the night, and the cricket enjoyed the stillness. 
As the Luna moth disappeared silently into the distance, the cricket saw another cricket. She too was a qu very quiet cricket. Then he rubbed his wings together one more time, and this time he chirped the most beautiful sound that she had ever heard. The Paper Bag Princess by Robert Munch, illustrated by Michael Marchenko. Elizabeth was a beautiful princess. She lived in a castle and had expensive princess clothes. She was going to marry a prince named Ronald. Unfortunately, a dragon smashed her castle, burned all of her clothes with his fiery breath, and carried off Prince Ronald. Elizabeth decided to chase the dragon and get Ronald back. She looked everywhere for something to wear, but the only thing she could find that was not burnt was a paper bag. So she put on the bag and followed the dragon. He was easy to follow because he left a trail of burnt forests and horses' bones. Finally, Elizabeth came to a cave with a large door that had a huge knocker on it. She took hold of the knocker and banged on the door. The dragon stuck his nose out of the door and said, Well, a princess. I love to eat princesses, but I have already eaten a whole castle today. I am a very busy dragon. Come back tomorrow. He slammed the door so fast that, that Elizabeth almost got her nose caught. Elizabeth grabbed the knocker and banged on the door again. The dragon stuck his nose out of the door and said, Go away! I love to eat princesses, but I have already eaten a whole castle today. I am a very busy dragon. Come back tomorrow. Wait! shouted Elizabeth. Is it true that you are the smartest and fiercest dragon in the whole world? Yes, said the dragon. Is it true, said Elizabeth, that you can burn up ten forests with your fiery breath? Oh, yes, said the dragon. And he took a huge, deep breath and breathed out so much fire that he burned up fifty forests. Fantastic, said Elizabeth. And the dragon took another huge breath and breathed out so much fire that he burnt up one hundred forests. Magnificent, said Elizabeth, and the dragon took another huge breath, but this time nothing came out. The da dragon didn't even have enough fire left to cook a meatball. Elizabeth said, Dragon, is it true that you can fly around the world in just ten seconds? Why, yes, said the dragon, and jumped up and flew all the way around the world in just ten seconds. He was very tired when he got back, but Elizabeth shouted, Fantastic! Do it again! So the dragon jumped up and flew around the whole world in just 20 seconds. When he got back, he was too tired to talk, and he lay down and went straight to sleep. Elizabeth whispered very softly, Hey, dragon! The dragon didn't move at all. She lifted up the dragon's ear and put her head right inside. She shouted as loud as she could, Hey, dragon! The dragon was so tired he didn't even move. Elizabeth walked right over the dragon and opened the door to the cave. There was Prince Ronald. He looked at her and said, Elizabeth, you are a mess. You smell like ashes, your hair is all tangled, and you are wearing a dirty old paper bag. Come back when you are dressed like a real princess. Ronald, said Elizabeth, your clothes are really pretty and your hair is very neat. You look like a real prince, but you are a bum. They didn't get married after all. Miss Nelson is Missing by Harry Allard, 
illustrated by James Marshall. The kids in room 207 were misbehaving again. Spitballs stuck to the ceiling. Paper planes whizzed through the air. They were the worst behaved class in the whole school. Now settle down, said Miss Nelson in a sweet voice. But the class would not settle down. They whispered and giggled. They squirmed and made faces. They were even rude during story hour, and they always refused to do their lessons. Something will have to be done, said Miss Nelson. The next morning, Miss Nelson did not come to school. Wow, yelled the kids, now we can really act up. They began to make more spitballs and paper planes. Today, let's be just terrible, they said. Not so fast hissed an unpleasant voice. A woman in an ugly black dress stood before them. I am your new teacher, Miss Viola Swamp, and she rapped the desk with her ruler. Where is Miss Nelson? asked the kids. Never mind that, snapped Miss Swamp. Open those arithmetic books. Miss Nelson's kids did as they were told. They could see that Miss Swamp was a real witch. She meant business. Right away she put them to work. And she loaded them down with homework. We'll have no story hour today, said Miss Swamp. Keep your mouths shut, said Miss Swamp. Sit perfectly still, said Miss Swamp. And if you misbehave, you'll be sorry, said Miss Swamp. The kids in room 207 had never worked so hard. Days went by and there was no sign of Miss Nelson. The kids missed Miss Nelson. Maybe we should try to find her, they said. Some of them went to the police. Detective McSmog was assigned to the case. He listened to their story. He scratched his chin. Hmm, he said, hmm. I think Miss Nelson is missing. Detective McSmog would not be much help. Other kids went to Miss Nelson's house. The shades were tightly drawn and no one answered the door. In fact, the only person they did see was the wicked Miss Viola Swamp coming up the street. If she sees us, she'll give us more homework. They got away just in time. Maybe something terrible happened to Miss Nelson. Maybe she was gobbled up by a shark, said one of the kids. But that didn't seem likely. Maybe Miss Nelson went to Mars, said another kid. But that didn't seem likely either. I know, exclaimed one know-it-all, maybe Miss Nelson's car was carried off by a swarm of angry butterflies, but that was the least likely of all. The kids in room 207 became very discouraged. It seemed that Miss Nelson was never coming back, and they would be stuck with Miss Viola Swamp forever. They heard footsteps in the hall. Here comes the witch, they whispered. Hello, children, someone said in a sweet voice. It was Miss Nelson. Did you see me, she asked. We certainly did, cried all the kids. Where were you? That's my little secret, said Miss Nelson. How about a story hour? Oh, yes, cried the kids. Miss Nelson noticed that during story hour, no one was rude or silly. What brought about this lovely change, she asked. That's our little secret, said the kids. That's all the time we have for Book Note today. You can find all of these books on the children's floor of our local library. Thank you for listening to Book Note.